like you, you're the person the world needs. Life is changing and the future is uncertain. You may not know how or why yet, but you know you're here to make a difference. You're not waiting for the universe to give you the answers. You're finding them for yourself. Challenging echoes with evidence. Few people have great ideas. Even fewer make them happen. It takes a dreamer, an explorer, a researcher, a leader, a thinker. It takes someone like you. Hello and welcome to UNSW's Year 12 Degrees and Scholarships Information Evening. Tonight will be your guide into preparing for university. You'll gain an insight into what life and class is like at UNSW. You'll gain some tips on how to apply for scholarships and we'll show you all the support that our UNSW teams can provide throughout the rest of 2022. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Bedigal, the Gadigal and the Ngunnawal peoples who are the traditional custodians of the land on which each of our UNSW campuses stand. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us this evening. I'm lucky enough to be joining you live from the Bedigal land, which is where UNSW Kensington campus is located. And I encourage you, go and find out what land you're joining from. If you feel comfortable, please share it in the Q&A chat. I can't wait to see where everyone is joining in from. So, this is a big, warm welcome to tonight's event. I'm Grace Bambridge, I'm from the Future Students team here at UNSW, and I'll be your host for this evening. I would like to say a big hello to our parents who are joining us, and to say thank you for your support that you provide the Year 12 students throughout this transition. And of course, a huge welcome to our Year 12 students joining us tonight. This is a great step that you've taken and I'm excited to inform you on all the things you need to know. We know the transition from Year 12 to university can be daunting, but I want you to have a key takeaway from tonight and that is that it's also the most exciting time of your life. So, for the agenda this evening, we'll cover the exciting study areas that UNSW offers. I'll then introduce current student Helen, who's going to share what life is like at UNSW. Helen will then come back to me, where I will talk to you about how you can boost your ATAR. And I want you to pay attention to this section, as it's quite important. We'll then throw to Susie and Bianca, who are going to share some top tips for your scholarship applications. We'll then show you how you can put together your UAC application so you're you can definitely preference your dream degree. At the end of all the presentations, I'm sure your mind will be buzzing with questions. So we're going to have a drop-in Q&A session where you can ask everything and anything. We'll have support from our team members across the scholarships, co-op program, the gateway program, employability and sport, and there'll also be a general Q&A session, which myself and wonderful Felix, a current student, will be able to answer anything and everything. Remember, no question is a silly question and you should definitely take advantage of this session. So, at UNSW, we have 60,000 students across three different campuses and six different faculties. You can choose from over 300 different degrees, so we're confident you'll find something that you like. This could range from media to engineering to law, for example. Just a humble little brag is that we're, we have Australia's most, gradu most employable graduates for the third year running. And this relates to our central work integrated learning platform, otherwise known as WILL. Don't worry, I'm going to get you up to speed on all the university lingo in no time. 
So our central work integrated learning platform connects industry partners with our current students to provide them with a practical skill set so they can graduate, graduate with confidence. And just a reminder, there is an employability team who are going to join our Q&A drop-in sessions and they'll be there to answer all your questions about practical opportunities and different careers at UN, um, beyond UNSW. So I'm sure you're, you're coming to a pretty critical time where you're thinking, what am I going to study? Well, if you're someone who isn't sure what they want to study, or maybe you want to study absolutely everything, I'd encourage you to go and look at our double degrees at UNSW. This is where if you have multiple passions or you're looking for a competitive edge in the job market, a double degree might be right for you. So, have you ever pictured thinking like an engineer, but also understanding how a large scale organization operates? Well, you could look to the Bachelor of Engineering Honours combined with the Bachelor of Commerce. And I need to stress to you, it's not double the workload or double the time. And all of our double degrees are offered across different, all of our faculties. So the key message is go and explore different study areas and different degree combinations because we think double degrees might be the right fit for you. Now I'm going to take you through the different study areas and programs that we have across our six different faculties. So the Arts, Design and Architecture faculty. Now we are very well known for our STEM research here at UNSW, but we also have top ranking subjects across the arts, humanities, creative arts, design and built environment. The Arts, Design and Architecture faculty has over 40 different disciplines for you to choose from. So you can ensure you'll gain a diverse perspective and the confidence to design the future that you want. At the Arts, Design and Architecture faculty, they'll connect you with industry while you're studying. You'll not only learn from academics, you'll learn from professionals. For example, you won't learn from an architect academic, you'll learn from a practicing architect who can connect you to people in the industry, build your connections, for example, meeting a firm director. Another wonderful component of our Ada faculty is our facilities. There's a purpose-built art and design campus in Paddington. It's jam-packed with studios and workshops and a museum standard gallery. We have the Design Futures Lab. It's a high-tech industry standard production centre for our built environment students. And there's the M Esme Timbere Creative Practice Hub with a multi-arts production hub. And when you join Arts, Design and Architecture, you're not only joining an inclusive and open community, you're, in, you're joining a community who's going to support you both creatively, practically, professionally and personally. Next up we have our UNSW Business School. At the Business School, they design their degrees alongside industry so you can graduate with confidence. At the Business School, the undergraduate offerings include our flagship Bachelor of Commerce, a Bachelor of Economics, Bachelor of Information Systems, Bachelor of Actuarial Studies, and of course, a Bachelor of Commerce combined with International, Bachelor of Commerce International. Yes, that's an extra year overseas for you to explore your, um, yeah. <laughs> Next in the Business School, we have our innovative and tech focused majors. So think things like financial technology, to marketing, to innovation, strategy and entrepreneurship. Or you can explore some more traditional areas of business like accounting or finance. At the UNSW Business School, we offer Career Accelerator. This is an exclusive suite of opportunities for our business school students. So you can do things like internships, networking, attend events, and you can also pursue global practicums. That means an opportunity to go overseas for credit and work with a business, say, in Bangkok. At the UNSW Engineering Faculty, you'll be learning at a number one engineering faculty in Australia. They have amazing streams in aerospace, bioinformatics, civil, mechatronic, quantum or solar energy. There's many to choose from. An innovative thing about the engineering faculty 
is and flexible thing is our flexible first year. This is where as a student, if you know you want to study engineering, but you're not sure about what it is you want to study, you can take the flexible first year in order to discover what that is and pursue it in your second year. Another area students rave about is the challenge program. This is where you'll be connected with industry and academics and you'll have multidisciplinary exposure. At the Law and Justice Faculty, it's a, num it's a world leading, sorry, at the Law and Justice Faculty, it's one of the world's top faculties for law, and they have a strong ethos for justice for all. You can pursue a Bachelor of Criminology and Criminal Justice, or the Bachelor of Laws, which is also known as the LLB. There's different double degree combinations for our law degree, and this is, these range from commerce to media, engineering and psychology. There's over 26 to choose from. At the Law and Justice Faculty, they have a focus on experiential learning. So you'll simultaneously study theory in the classroom and experience in action. There's a fully functioning King Kingsford Legal Centre for you to benefit from. Moving on to our Medicine and Health Faculty. They have program offerings in clinical and non-clinical applications. Think Bachelor of Medical Studies with a Doctor of Medicine, Bachelor of International Public Health, Bachelor of Vision Science, and combined vision science with clinical optometry. We're so excited to announce in 2023, we have a new suite of programs in primary and allied health. For example, in just five years, you can study a Bachelor of Exercise Science combined with a Master of Physiotherapy and Exercise Physi Physiology. Yes, that's two degrees in five years with three accreditations. No matter the degree you choose at the Medicine and Health Faculty, we're, in sh we're sure you're going to be prepared to lead a future, the future of health. In our science faculty, it's one of the largest and most diverse faculties in Australia. There's over 26 majors to choose from in your Bachelor of Science. And we have specialist degrees in aviation, both flying and management, data science and decisions, environmental management, material science and engineering, medical science and psychology. A wonderful component of the science faculty is it's, it's got over 400 industry partners for work integrated learning. Remember, you can jump onto the employability Q&A later and ask away. Finally, we have our UNSW Canberra. That's where we have a partnership with the Australian Defence Force Academy for over 50 years. They have four schools of study and a range of different degrees. UNSW Canberra is available for those enrolled in the ADFA Trainee Officers Program, as well as the non-defence and defence, as well as being a non-defence and defence civilian undergraduate sponsored student. I encourage you to go on the UNSW Canberra website to find out more. So, We've covered all the different study areas and places and programs that you might be able to explore in your future. And I wanted to reiterate that we're not all about the books here at UNSW. We have the wonderful current student, Helen, who had a chat with us yesterday about what life is like at UNSW. And we'll, cr we'll show you that now. Hi everyone, my name's Helen and I'm a Bachelor of Commerce student. Here is where I study. Here I have my lectures where I get to debate current topics and also tutorials where I get to collaborate with other students in interactive lessons, gaining the direct support from tutors. I'm a marketing major and a major is where you get to complete various subjects within the one field to really gain some expertise in that area. My assessments allow me to immerse myself in course content and also practically apply all the theory that I've learnt from lectures and tutorials. I like to think of a lecture like a school assembly where there are multiple speakers delivering informative information and a large group of people listening to that speaker. Tutorials on the other hand are a bit more engaging, there's usually one teacher to about 25 students and you all get to learn from each other by going through the course content. The UNSW 3 plus structure really allows me to choose my workload across three terms. I can select up to three subjects per term and this really gives me the flexibility to complete 
additional work experience and also extracurricular activities. I'm all settled into uni now and loving my experience so far. In my spare time, I love getting involved in student societies such as the Business Society and giving back to the local community through ARC-led volunteering initiatives such as the Wellness Warriors and Street Team. These extracurricular activities allow me to meet new friends, develop my personal skills and also to make a positive impact to those around me. I also love that I can fit it into my spare time in between lectures and tutorials, even during assessment periods when things can get a bit busy. I'm coming into my third term and I'm currently completing an internship experience at a fintech company where I can hopefully gain some marketing experience. It's great being able to fit an internship into my term because I can network with industry professionals, connect with like-minded students, and also discover what it's really like working in the marketing space. An added bonus is that it contributes towards the completion of my degree and I can gain some really valuable hands-on experience. Oh, we have the most amazing students here at UNSW. Thank you so much to Helen for sharing. So now we're going to dive in your, to details about how you can boost your ATAR. Because here at UNSW, we know you are more than your ATAR and we've come up with a number of ways that you can showcase your passion and your talent to boost your chances of receiving an offer through UAC at UNSW. So we've introduced the UNSW portfolio entry. And basically, this is an online submission direct through UNSW, and it's a chance for you to showcase your passion or creative potential in order to only boost your chances of admission to UNSW. So, this is for domestic applicants only, and you do need to have pref your preferred or chosen degree in UAC to be eligible. I'd like to take note of the key dates. Now, they will be updated on the portfolio entry website as soon as possible. However, applications will open in early September and close in early December. You can study, uh, you can choose the, you, to submit a UNSW portfolio entry across art and design, built environment, the Bachelor of Engineering or the Faculty of Engineering Admissions Scheme, and the Bachelor of Information Systems. I do encourage you to go and look at the full list of degrees that are available on the portfolio entry website. So how you can apply to the portfolio entry? Well, as I mentioned, you need to apply through UAC. So this is making sure that you preference your chosen degree in UAC. You'll then need to prepare your submission for our online portal. I'd encourage you again, head to our website because there's lots of tips and tricks and information on, your, on the best submissions and what you need to do. Step number three is of course, submit before the deadline. I will like to flag that all submissions are final. However, if you start your application, your submission, you can save as you go, but once you hit submit, that does mean it's final. And just a reminder that offers are received through UAC. Next up, we have our HSC Plus scheme. This is a reward for students who perform well in specific year 12 subjects that are relevant to your preferred degree. You can gain up to five points and the best part about it is it's automatic. You don't need to do anything. It comes straight through your UAC application. I encourage you, if you're keen, to look on our website as you can see the different degrees and the required results and how many points you're eligible to gain. At UNSW, we also have an Elite Athletes, Performers and Leaders program. This is where we recognise significant achievement across sport, academia, leadership and music in year 11 and 12. Now, as a reminder, there is the sports team on our on the Q&A session today. So I encourage you, if you are interested in speaking about the elite athletes, you can chat to them about this program. Again, it's a maximum of five points. And the most important piece of t information is that it is a submission app process directly through UNSW. So you will need to gather all your supporting documentation by November 30th. 
You can visit the website for more details. Next, we have the Educational Access Scheme. So, this is a scheme administered through UAC, so it isn't through UNSW. However, you can gain additional points to a UNSW program. This scheme recognises hardship in, say, an illness, financial hardship, language difficulties, and educational disadvantage. You can gain between 1 to 10 points with this program, and the application details are on their website. That is the UAC website. As a reminder, we have our Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine admissions pathways. So you can do the Rural Entry, the Indigenous Entry into Medicine Scheme, or the Low SES Entry Scheme, which is our gateway program. As a reminder, we did host recently a Medicine Information Evening on YouTube. So you can go back and look at that and find out a detailed information about this degree. And finally, we have our UNSW Gateway Program. This is the only opportunity for early conditional offers at UNSW. There is a Gateway team ready to chat to you in our Q&A drop-in sessions, so I really encourage you to go and chat to them about this program. You can chat to them about if you're eligible, and you can also chat to them about what the Gateway programs are. I am flagging that there are some gateway programs open for application in July. If you participate in the UNSW gateway programs, you, are, you may be eligible for an early conditional offer, but you also may be eligible for priority to our equity scholarships. As a reminder, there's also the scholarships team online for our Q&A sessions later. Now I'm going to throw to Susie and Bianca, they did have a chat yesterday about scholarship applications, best tips and tricks. Hi, welcome to our discussion about UNSW scholarships. Every year, UNSW offers a range of scholarships from equity, merit, sport, accommodation, to the more industry focused ones like co-op and women in engineering. I'm joined today by Susie, who is an elite athlete and scholarship recipient, and we're going to have a little chat about some of the best tips Susie can give you when it comes to applying for a scholarship. So welcome, Susie. Thank you very much for having me. So tell us a little bit about the scholarships you have and when you were awarded them. Okay, so um, throughout my time at UNSW, I've had three scholarships. So I was awarded the Ben Lexon Scholarship, which is for mainly sport, but also a little bit of academics and leadership. Um, and that was for my first two years um, here at UNSW. And then my third year, I was awarded the Elite Athlete Scholarship. Um, and then my fourth year, I was awarded the um, Mark Doherty Athletic Scholarship, which is for sport, but also kind of giving back to the community. Um, so the way that UNSW works is that you actually have to apply or reapply every year for the scholarships, which is why I've had such a diverse range in scholarships. Um, but in saying that, I also did apply in, my, um, in year 12 for my first year scholarship. So you reapply every year. Yeah. Fantastic. And what kind of opportunities have they opened up for you? A lot. <laughs> um, so I guess the really obvious one is the financial um, aspect of it. Um, so, I mean, as an athlete and also a student, there is a little bit of, bit of a financial burden. So having this um, financial support has been really important. Um, I've been able to focus much more on my sport and also on my academics um, because I don't have to take as much time out of my week for a casual job, which is really important for me at least. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, there's also so many other opportunities I've had um, and like connections and the ability to meet other people. Um, there's a really nice community within the scholarship holders um, and it depends what kind of scholarship you have. For example, with sport and I study exercise physiology, so I obviously have like a bit of like, a lot of an interest in sport. Um, so I've been able to meet some incredible sports people as, also, as well as like other people who work in the sport industry, which is a really useful thing for me for my career as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got other degrees such as um, like women in engineering or more industry ones, you like have incredible um, connections there as well. So I guess there's the financial gain, but also the other things as well, such as the connections. Amazing. And it's great to know that you can get a scholarship throughout your degree and not just at the entry point. Yeah. But we're joined by lots of year 12s. 
So let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So applying for a scholarship as a high school student, what are, what are your top tips around how to approach it? Yeah, well, I mean, I've definitely learned a lot throughout the process. <laughs> um, I think the first thing is to just apply for everything. UNSW has so many different scholarships, and I must say, I didn't even realise the Mark Doherty scholarship was available until I got it. So um, just apply for everything. There's a nifty little um, thing you can do on our scholarship website where you just put in anything that might be like um, specific to you. So for example, I put in sport or women or anything like that, and that just shows up with all the um, scholarships that are available. So I would definitely apply for them. Um, but the other thing is to apply early. Um, while the scholarship applications aren't too extensive, they do require time. Um, so I know there's the school holidays coming up and I think that's always such a great time. Yeah. <laughs> um, gives yeah. you some time away from um, you know, what you're studying to just kind of focus on the applications. Um, and in saying that, I think there's lots of reasons to make sure you have time, mainly so that you can really answer the questions well, um, because if they do look rushed, it's not as good of an application. Yeah. Um, and I guess kind of approach them like an essay question where you're trying to answer every aspect of the, um, of the question and make sure that you're answering all of the question because um, if any uh, aspect of the application is left unanswered, obviously UNSW can't use that. Yeah. Um, but also make sure you get your friends and family to spell check um, and look for <laughs> things like that. Um, you Making sure that you have enough time to do this is really important. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I would say be specific. Um, in year 12, um, there's lots of things you can kind of pull on for your um, application. However, I would kind of limit it to things that you did in year 10, 11, and 12, because these are a little bit more specific and relevant for the uni. Um, but also, making sure that, like, if you're applying in year 11 or starting to think about it in year 11, making sure that you're taking those activities into year 12, because it really looks good that um, you are doing these extracurricular activities in year 12. But also, it's good for kind of your well-being and things during year 12, because it's a very stressful time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess my two things would be kind of start early and be really specific with what you're um, putting in there. Excellent. And what kind of like supporting documentation did you provide? Yeah. Um, well, I think every scholarship will have, I think we'll want your academic transcript. That's a pretty um, big one for most scholarships, but it also depends on what scholarship you're looking at. So for example, um, if mine's a sports scholarship, um, and also leadership in year, like the Ben Lexham was also leadership based. Yeah. Um, so putting in things such as um, awards that you've been given, so any school awards. I got a couple of academic awards I put in there as well. Um, if I broke any records, they often gave um, certificates, so I'd put things like that in. Um, so pretty much anything that supports what you're applying yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, okay. So we've looked at the more technical side mm -hmm. of the application process. What about the, the scholarships um, process that asks students to really sort of shine and show their best selves or their achievements or whatnot? Yeah. So how do you advise for students to approach that? You know, that's a hard thing. Um, sometimes it can be hard to realise what you've done when you're just looking at it by yourself. So I think it's really important to talk to other people, yeah. um, talk to your friends and family, but also in year 12 you have all this other support such as careers advisors. Um, you've also got teachers as well who you can draw on for support. So in year 12, I mainly talked to my career advisor, but also my head of sport. He was really great. He actually put me up for the scholarship, which you know, I didn't really realise was an option until he talked to me about it. And we kind of um, worked out what made me stood out, uh, stand out. Sorry. Um, so for example, for the Ben Lexon scholarship, um, my last year have been a little bit more athletic specific, but for the Ben Lexon, um, the thing that made me stand out was that I was well-rounded, so at least in sports. So I had my, um, you know, I was very good at athletics, but um, I was also quite competitive in things like touch football and hockey, which the university found really useful. Cool. Um, so trying to find things that stand out for you, like that was definitely a big reason why I got offered the Ben Lexon. So talk to your um, teachers, talk to your friends and family to figure out an aspect that makes you stand out from other applicants. Absolutely, because yeah. you never know what other people can see. You, you know, you might be like, oh, I never knew I shone in that yeah. area. Yeah. yeah, I would have focused purely on athletics and they were like, no, you've got the other sports. Yeah. Uh, so that was really <laughs> useful for me, yeah. That's wonderful. That's all we've got time for at the moment. So thank you so much. No and thank you everyone so much for joining us.
I highly recommend that you jump into the scholarships Q&A session after the presentation tonight. And we've also got the co-op team. They, they've got a separate Q&A session, so feel free to jump in there. A lot of the tips we've spoken about now are very general tips, so it's, it's good to note that um, each scholarship application has slightly different requirements. So it's a great idea to pop into the scholarships Q&A and ask the team about um, the ones that you're interested in or what UNSW offers. So thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Susie and Bianca. I hope you've all taken some notes and are getting ready to apply for all the scholarships we have on offer. Now we're going to take you through how to apply at UNSW. So with how to apply at UNSW, we do have some key UAC dates for you to be aware of. And what we're going to do here is take you through how you can apply for your dream degree. So the UAC application process is online and it requires you to preference one to five programs. As on the screen here, there is an early bird application for UAC and that closes on the 30th of September. I will say to you, fear not if you miss this deadline. It doesn't mean you can't apply for UAC, however, it does mean your application fee will be a little bit more expensive. For the UAC application, I want you to take away that you can change your preferences at any time before a certain date for each offer round. That is, you can always change your mind. So, even if you accept an offer in an earlier round, say for example, one of, the, one of the rounds prior to our first participating round for UNSW, which is the December round two, that doesn't mean you can't preference and participate in the round that we are participating in, meaning you're not locked into it only accepting an offer from a single round. You can check the UAC website for key dates of each round. And I do encourage you to come to our open day or info day so you can chat about your application process with people from UNSW. So, some specifics around your application through UAC for a UNSW degree. As a reminder, at UNSW we have assumed knowledge. This means we don't have any prerequisites. Assumed knowledge means we expect that level of knowledge from day one in the coursework. So for example, the Bachelor of Commerce has advanced maths as their mathematics advanced as their assumed knowledge. If you don't think you have that level of mathematical knowledge, we encourage you to do a bridging course or take your own private tutoring or take advantage of the many student offerings like career mentoring, sorry, peer mentoring that is on offer for students so they can get help with their academia. At UNSW, some of our programs do have additional selection criteria. For example, the Bachelor of Aviation has an internal application to the School of Aviation and you will need to attend an interview. That is the Bachelor of Aviation flying. For the, our combined law degrees, you will be required to do the law admissions test, also known as the LAT, it's where we'll assess your critical thinking, analytical and communication skills. It works on a sliding scale, so it does take in both of these re requirements. Of course, the Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine, again, I encourage you to go and look at the Medicine Information Evening, but it does require the UCAT ANZ, a medicine application, and then based on these and your ATAR, you may be invited to an interview you will be assessed on all three of these areas. Our Bachelor of Music has an online assessment and an audition requirement. And as a defence student at UNSW Canberra, there is specific Defence Force recruiting requirements. I will flag that this can take up to 12 months, so it is um, encouraged that you start this application process in Year 11. We have our co-op scholarship degrees, now we have our wonderful students on we have our wonderful students on 
um, sorry. We have the co-op scholarship degree and we have our co-op team online right now waiting for you in the drop-in Q&A sessions. So if you have questions about the application process, please ask away. So let's get into the nitty gritty of getting an offer to UNSW. As a reminder, at UNSW, we don't have guaranteed entry, but we do showcase whether you're competitive or not based on your selection rank. Now your selection rank is your raw ATAR plus any adjustment factors, and this is indicative. You can find the 2022 lowest selection ranks as indicators on our downloadable UG guide or on our degrees website. So, we're going to take you through a few examples so that we can make sure you preference your dream degree for next year. So on this example, the student has received an ATAR of 84. They have adjustment factors of 11 based on this example. And that means their combined selection rank is a 95. As you can see there, this student has successfully preferenced Number one, a Bachelor of Engineering Honours combined with Commerce. That selection rank criteria is a 93. And I will flag that that's based on the Bachelor of Commerce requirement as we do take your highest entry requirement into consideration. Preferences two to five are also listed here. However, the student for this will be competitive for number one, number two, in fact, all of the offerings here, all of the preference degrees here, this student is competitive for. However, they are only going to receive an offer for their first preference, as UAC takes in consideration one to five in the hierarchy of one to five. So that means, again, the student will receive an offer in this round to the Bachelor of Honours com Connors combined with Commerce, and they won't receive an offer to preferences two to five. Let's try this again. This is the same student, let's say, and they have an ATAR of 84, adjustment factors for the purpose of this example of 11, and a selection rank of 95. However, they got a bit nervous and they've changed their preferences around. They've put their dream degree as number three because they weren't really sure if they were going to meet the selection rank that was indicated. So, what the student has done is they've put a degree one, a degree two, and then they've put their Bachelor of Engineering Honours and Commerce as their third preference. As you can see here, the student is competitive for preferences one to five. Unfortunately though, this student will only receive an offer in this round to the first preference, which means their dream degree, they won't receive an offer. However, this student can still participate in another round and change their preferencing order. So just a reminder, they're having degree one as their offer because they haven't put their preferences in the way that they envisage their dream degrees. Let's do one more example so we can be absolutely certain that you're going to nail your UAC application process. So this student has an ATAR of 84. They've received adjustment factors of three, so a total selection rank of 87. As you can see here, the student has mixed results based on their preferences. They aren't competitive for one and two. However, they are competitive for their third preference, which means they'll receive an offer to the Bachelor of Food Science. And again, their fourth and fifth, they are, they are competitive for these programs, but they won't receive an offer. Now, we'll have this available so you can go back and view it again if you need to. We're being a little bit cheeky here because we know the school holidays are a time for rest, but they're also a time for you to take advantage and get ahead in your university application process. We have our scholarships that are open until September, so you may want to consider having a look at your scholarship application during this time. You can have a look at your adjustment factors, work out what you need to get um, and how many potential points you could earn. We have our portfolio entry. You might start to think about um, your creative portfolio and what you might want to showcase. 
And of course, as a reminder, save your money and apply for the UAC Early Bird by September 30. So, we are going to wrap up now and I just wanted to give you a few reminders that open day is on September 3rd and we are putting our best foot forward. The campus will be on full display and you'll be able to connect with students, academics and all of our university teams. I encourage you to get your phones out and download our digital 2023 UG guide. This is where you can see those lowest selection ranks that we talked about just a little bit earlier. And if you have more questions after the Q&A session, you can contact our future student advisors. So now it is time for question time. We have representatives available in our drop-in sessions, which will be posted in the Q&A chat right after this. We have representatives from Gateway, Accommodation, Scholarships, the Co-op Program, and of course, Employability and Sport. There'll also be a general Q&A session led by myself, and the wonderful current student, Felix. We're going to answer any and all of your questions. As a reminder, going into these Q&A sessions, no question is a silly question, and you should really take advantage of this. Thank you so much for coming and attending this evening. We, we hope you've gained some helpful information into the rest of your year 12 year. Good luck and farewell. We're going to get the room ready now, so give us a minute and Felix and I will be ready for the general Q&A very soon. Okay, as you can see, we've done a little shuffle and we're now ready to answer all of your questions. Um, 
You know who I am? I'm Grace, but we also have Felix here. Felix, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you're studying? Hi everyone, I'm Felix and I'm currently a fifth year student here at UNSW. I've been studying a Bachelor of Advanced Science majoring in Physics and Mathematics as well as a Bachelor of Computer Science that whole time. It's a couple of degrees that I've really, really enjoyed both for all the fun stuff I get to do in the classroom, such as play around with some high-powered lasers, and also just the really good student experience that goes alongside that, such as the Computer Science Society's weekly barbecue every Wednesday. Amazing. I think you're probably one of the most knowledgeable students we have available to speak to you, so I would take advantage and ask all the general questions you have on answer. Now I will flag, we'll try and our best to answer as many of these questions as we can, but we might not be able to get through them all. So I'm going to start off with an interesting one. It's about um, the UAC application process and it has asked, is it better to put the preferences with the highest ATAR first? Now, I can answer that and then I'll also get Felix to shed light on his advice as well. So, I believe you should preference your degrees in the way you think about what you would absolutely love to do as a first off and then put down to five as something you're absolutely comfortable with doing but it might not be your absolute number one choice. So, um, up to you on what the ATAR requirements are but I wouldn't say that that should lead your decision because if there's something you're really passionate about then of course put that as your number one. As I mentioned earlier you won't get an offer to that program unless it's number one and you are competitive for it. Felix, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I think that's kind of the main thing to keep in mind is that you get offered your first eligible preference. So it really is, you want to be putting them in the order that you want to receive them in. I think when I was in high school, people were always talking about like not wasting your, your ATAR and having to go for the highest number, but really it's about, you know, not wasting your university experience and just studying what you really want to study. With that being said, a lot of our degrees, such as what I study, the Bachelor of Advanced Science, they have we have quite a lot of similar degrees. So there's also the Bachelor of Science, which has a bit of a lower ATAR typically than the Bachelor of Advanced Science. So it can be a good idea if there's a couple of degrees that cover those interests and you're happy to study either of those, then yeah, maybe do that case where you put the higher one higher and the lower one slightly lower as a bit of a backup. Yeah, that's such good advice. Um... We actually have a good question for you in here. So there's <laughs> one questions. about honours degree, yeah, but specific to your <laughs> skill set, I think. Um, can you apply for an honours degree when you're a high schooler? Yeah, so what an honours degree kind of is, just to kind of fill some people in, because some people might not have heard of it, an honours degree is kind of like a master's equivalent, at least in Australia. Typically, it's a year of research you do after you've completed your kind of like standard three-year undergraduate. With most of our degrees, they're not what are called honours degrees, but something like the Bachelor of Advanced Science, it is an honours degree. So that means you apply for it in year 12, as with any other like normal undergraduate, but then that honours is built into your program. So you automatically go in and do it after your like, three-year undergraduate. Um, another one, engineering also has that honours built in because it's yep. part of the requirement of being Good an example. engineer. <laughs> with the degrees such as, like for example, sticking on home territory and talking about advanced science versus science. So science doesn't have that honours built in, but it's then something that you can apply for once you get to university and you kind of hit third year and you think maybe that's something you actually want to do. So you can either apply for it straight away, apply for it at university, and equally, if you're in something like advanced science and realise you don't want to do honours, you can transfer down to science and you don't have to do it. Brilliant. Um, we have a lot of questions about scholarships, so I think we can touch on it and then I encourage you if you are looking to do um, to chat more about scholarships. Our wonderful scholarships team is actually in another drop-in Q&A so you can speak directly to them as they are the experts. But this one is a little bit more general and it's about um, when they should apply for scholarships and is it a very specific process. So. Um, when you should apply, it's if you're in year 12 and you're a high school leaver, the deadline is for this year is September 30th. So basically, you have to apply before then, otherwise you won't be eligible for a 2023 scholarship. Um, and then, is it a very specific process? Have you ever applied for a scholarship? Uh, yes, so I've applied for a couple of scholarships, both when I was in high school and then I kind of continued to do it at university. It's all done through the same system. 
and it's not really a very specific process. Essentially, we just have one website that covers it all. And it's kind of like going to like any kind of website like Amazon or something doing online shopping. You basically just put in a couple of search filters like you say, I'm a high school leaver. If you're me, you say I'm interested in science. And then you press go and a big like list of all the scholarships comes up at the moment. It might not be all of them. Uh, we kind of update it throughout the year. So it's always a good idea to keep checking right up until that deadline. But you'll see those scholarships there kind of under those broad categories. You click on them and they might have a couple of extra criteria. And then you basically hit like an add to basket button in a way and it kind of gets added to your profile. From that point, all there's kind of like a standard profile you fill out for all of the scholarships that you apply for, which covers things like extracurricular activities you're doing, academic achievements, examples of leadership, kind of, you know, the three main areas we look at generally. And then you'll upload supporting documentation, you know, to support what you say in those sections. But then for each individual scholarship, typically they might have one or two either extra questions or supporting documentations, letter of reference, stuff like that. But it's just a couple of extra stuff that you do for each scholarship application on top. And some of them don't even have, have that generally. It's, yeah, pretty general. Perfect. That's some great insight. And again, just a reminder, if you have more scholarship questions, hop onto the scholarship Q&A um, session because they'll be able to answer everything that you need to know. And they want to talk to you, so I encourage you to go and say hello to them as well. Um, we have another one that's, what can I do if I don't get in the course I want through my ATAR or early entry? Are you happy to answer that one or would you like me uh, yeah. to go? Yeah, I can go into that. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is also, so we don't just look at your ATAR, we, all, we look at what's called your selection rank, which is kind of your ATAR plus any what we call adjustment factors, which are essentially like bonus points. And through kind of there's three schemes, so HSC plus rewards you for doing well in like high school subjects that we think, you know, are good indicators of how you'll perform at specific uni degrees. Elite athletes, performers, and leaders exist to like recognize if you're doing any significant extracurricular activity. And then UAC also runs the educational access scheme for anyone who's kind of suffered from some long term something that's limited their study. You were listening to my presentation. It's very <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, I had to go through the process myself. So all in the brain. That being said, if you still fall short with those schemes, there are other pro ways that you can consider getting in. So for things like our built environment, arts and design degrees, and also our engineering degrees, we offer a portfolio entry, which again, the main thing to keep in mind with that is we're not necessarily looking for people who are like the best engineers or the best architects. Like the whole point of coming to university is to learn how to be that. We're just really looking for students who are passionate about those areas of study and specifically passionate about studying it here at UNSW. That being said, there are then again two. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to say that being said quite a lot this no, evening. No, you're good. You've but there got are two. All the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two other what we call kind of transfer ways that you can get into certain degrees. So if you start at UNSW in a different degree, for example, if you were looking at studying law, because we always offer that as a double degree, what you might consider is starting in the single degree that you would have partnered with law, and then you apply to transfer through what's called an internal program transfer, which is through the university itself. We look at your marks at university, and you can do that once you've done roughly three quarters of a year of study with us. And for especially for things like law that are highly competitive, we do reserve up to 100 places specifically for people to come in. And because you will have been studying the single degree that you would have paired with it, you're not going to be disadvantaged or lose out on time. The one thing that we do say with that is if you're going for um, certain other degrees where it's not a case of like you're looking to do a double, just bear in mind that those processes like applying through UAC are competitive and there is always a chance that as unfortunate as it is, you might not be successful. So just make sure that whatever degree you do choose to start studying, you are happy with the possibility that you will finish with that as well. And of course, the last transfer is what's called kind of like an external program transfer, which is you use your marks from studying either at TAFE, at a certificate four level or higher, or at another university in Australia or overseas, and you use your marks from that to apply through UAC to study at one of our degrees. Brilliant, thank you so much for that insight. And I will say, speaking to students or current students at UNSW, internal program transfers are actually really common, more common than you think. It's not something that's frowned upon in any way. So if it's something that happens or you change your mind with your degree that you're studying, just remember that's always available to our students. 
Ah, um, let's go. We'll have a next question. So we've got one about a double degree. <laughs> and that's a great thing because Felix is doing a double degree. So is there a certain set of double degrees for me to choose from? Or can I make my own combinations at my own will? So I can take this one. UNSW has a specific set of double degrees that you can choose from. There is an offering in every single faculty and as many as we can offer, we do. Um, what you can do is hop onto our degrees website and you can really explore all the different options. But um, no, you can't just pick and choose every degree with every different combination, unfortunately. But um, there is a lot of degrees on offer in the double degree combinations and it's something um, that we offer as much as possible. And question two is, how do you achieve in a double degree? Does it mean double the study time than the average students? I think I'll throw <laughs> this one to you because I'd love to get, obviously we'll answer this question, but I'd love to get an insight into how you kind of manage your time and what, what a double degree means for you really. Yeah, um, so I think kind of the first thing to kind of quash is that notion that a double degree is double the workload. So you still do the same number of courses as everyone else. So typically for me, that's eight courses a year split over our three terms. Um, for those of you doing the math at home, that means you get to have a lighter term of just two courses, which is good if you want to like do some other stuff, which is when I get to like play around and pretend to be a scientist in a lab, which is always <laughs> good fun. But aside from that, you're still doing the same amount of work each time. How it essentially works is that most of our degrees are structured, so you kind of have what's called like the core component, which is the stuff that we say, like everyone studying a science degree who wants to be a physicist, for example, from my experience, has to have done these courses. And then you'll often then have what are called electives, which is extra courses that you take from either around your faculty or from around the university to kind of give you that holistic degree. With a double degree, essentially what happens is that rather than having those electives in your single degree, we replace it with the core of the second degree. Typically, they're larger than the electives, which is why a double degree is longer than just doing one degree. But, you know, normally it's like one year, two years if it's an honours degree. And when you compare that with like, you know, three plus three, it's still a lot less time and you're still doing the same amount of courses. Um, and I suppose it's just an insight, I suppose, because you're here <laughs> and it's good for the students to hear how do you... Um, manage your time, what does your term look like, I suppose, this this term? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just give us a little bit more about your personal experience having a double degree. Uh, yeah, so normally with university, typically I'm on campus about four days a week in terms of classwork, um, but quite a lot of that is not necessarily, it's not four full days. So for example, this term, uh, I really have two half days and two full days, and one day where I'm not on campus at all, which is good. It does vary whether you're doing like one of our more social science type degrees. So if you're doing like law or arts, you tend to have less what are called contact hours than me doing STEM. That's because STEM, you tend to have a lot of in-person laboratory type classes where it's you in the classroom actually like playing around with like multimeters or devices and, you know, building stuff. Whereas an arts or law student might have more like reading material, so stuff that they have to go over ahead of time for lectures at home. But... Yeah, again, it's really effectively, if you look at that, so like two half days and two full days kind of is really only three days all up. But typically I'm on campus for most of the day because I'm taking advantage of all the other parts of university. So it's things like student societies. Every year I try, out, I try and try out a new one. This year it's the running society, which has been great. Oh. Every Monday we have like a training. Every Friday we have like a social run. And even on Saturdays I now do a 5K race with them. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so there's a whole like social life and social network that comes with university. And really like, you know, you'll find it hard to leave campus once you come on, I'm sure. And I think with a double degree, you've got double the community as well. <laughs> yeah. With <laughs> your different degrees and different classmates. So we'll keep going. But we've got one here about does being in the SRC at school add any extra ATAR points? So we think back to the presentation, there was a mentioning of our elite athletes, performers and leaders um, program, which is where you have the potential to submit an online application through UNSW website and you can get recognised for things such as leadership which would be inclusive of an SRC role, um, academia, sport, um, I'm missing one, what else is there? Music so, is a music. classic one. There we go. <laughs> 
Um, so this is something that you should consider looking into. I encourage you hop on the website after this or look at it in the school holidays because that's where you can um, submit that application. And if memory serves me correctly, you need to have all your supporting documentation ready by the 30th of November. Cool. Okay, there's lots of questions coming through, so thanks everyone. Um, we are going to keep this pretty general for this evening as we don't have our laptops in front of us. So if there's any super question, technical questions, we will strive to get back to you um, as soon as possible. And remember that our future student advisors are available Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can chat to them on the phone, via email or live chat if your question doesn't get answered tonight. So we've got a question from Monica. Hi, Monica. Um, do we know how many adjustment factor marks I qualify for with the ability to adjust my ATAR? So with this, um, we would say that you can estimate how many you might be eligible for, but you won't know until you receive your UAC offer. Um, so for our UNSW options, we of course got the HSC Plus, which you can earn up to five um, points. There's also the Elite Athletes and Performers and Leaders program, which I also discussed before, which has up to five points. And then our education, the Educational Access Scheme that's administered through UAC also has up to 10 points. Um, for Year 12s, applying for 2023, it is possible for you to get up to 12 points if you're eligible. That's the maximum amount of points UNSW will recognise. Um, in addition to your ATAR. And of course, there are some degrees that aren't eligible for these points. Um, so more information on that will be available on each of the degree pages. Have I missed anything? <laughs> no, I think you pretty well covered it. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, so we've got a good one, which I think you're across. So I'm going <laughs> to hand it to you if that's okay. Of course. Tell me if it's not, <laughs> but we've got can you become a pharmacist if you enroll in medicinal chemistry? Um, so the kind of quick answer is no. So a medicinal chemist is not a pharmacist. A pharmacist is a quite highly regulated and professional degree. What a medicinal mm -hmm. chemist is, is someone who doesn't work in like prescribing drugs. They're that person kind of behind the scene who works in like drug design or drug development. So it's much more on the science of you know drugs rather than the actual people facing health side of things if that is what you want to study we are actually newly introducing this year a combined master's program so it's a bachelor's of pharmaceuticals and master's of pharmacy which is the degree that you would take if you wanted to become a registered pharmacist brilliant thank you so much felix <laughs> um cool we've got a few more coming in Keep up the good work, everyone. Love to see it. Um, I've got another one for you. What are trimesters like and when and how long do the terms go for? Um, so I'm, I actually had the advantage. I'm one of the like few people probably still kicking around the university who studied under both the semesters and our new three-term model. So the thing to keep in mind is that with us, with semesters before, you were studying four subjects for 13 weeks, whereas now you're studying three for 10. So it's, the term is a bit shorter, which means that there is a little bit of a higher workload per course over that term. But the fact that you're doing three rather than four, and of course, when we were saying before, the standard load is eight, so you have like a lighter term, which gives you two. It is generally, there's less contact hours and kind of less pressure than, than before. Then with that, typically you have the first term runs kind of from February, second one which we've kind of just started now is like July through to kind of start of September. And then the last term covers like November up until kind of mid-December. With that, you do get an extended break over the kind of December period. We do offer a summer ter term as well if you want to like catch up on something or really kind of cram your studies. But I've always found summer is a great time to take advantage of, you know, just taking a break or even getting involved in a whole range of different other stuff on campus. So I've had things like research scholarships or research internships. As a scientist, I know lots of my other friends just do like in industry or like corporate internships as well over summer, which is a great way to like build a lot of experience from your degree. And the fact that, you know, you, we have that term model, which was designed specifically in, the, in mind to like make those opportunities available 
I know a lot more of my friends have been successful in finding those up once we switch to three terms versus the semesters. That's great to hear. And and have you, I guess, taken advantage of, or do you find it easier with the terms to be able to do um, extracurricular or say an internship or research, for example, um, throughout the term because you're technically doing a f one or two less subjects? Um, yeah, I think um, no matter what model that you study under, there's yeah. always going to be some crunch periods in university Absolutely. where you have to focus. But generally, I do find that I've had a lot more free time and time that I can spend, which for the most part, it's been doing things like you said, like getting involved with student societies, doing, you know, taking advantage of just having free time or, yeah, again, like internships, kicking around in a lab when I can, like once or twice a week, helping out. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> threw that one at you. <laughs> um, okay, we've got a question here about work integrated learning. So they've asked us to explain more about work integrated learning. Okay, so work integrated learning basically translates to say work experience. Um, this is where UNSW will connect you with industry. So whether that's through an internship or a practicum um, that you can do for credit while you're studying. Um, what else? Have you had an example of taking advantage of work integrated learning yet? Um, yeah, so like I've said, I tend to do more of my work integrated learning stuff o over the summer, so yeah. take advantage of that full time, but of course it's essentially the same thing, so rather than spending your summer time doing that work if you want, you do it as part of your degree and you get the advantage of it's not just something you're doing on the side extra for a bit of fun, it's something that actually counts towards completing the degree while you're there. Amazing. Um, and I think the key message is when we talk about work integrating and learning as well and the platform that we offer is that there is support to help you. So there's also support with our work integrated learning platform to help you source, say, an internship if that's something you were interested in doing. Um, and yeah, hopefully that answers it. If you have more questions, we love talking about work integrated learning. So please <laughs> post more. <laughs> Yeah, I'd really recommend taking advantage and like trying some at some point in your degree, not just because like, as everyone jokes about like employers are always looking for the uni student who's already had like 20 years of experience. But if you have had a little bit of experience, it is a really great way to help you get your foot in the door. But aside from that, it's also a great way for you personally to find out what you enjoy and what you want to do when you graduate or on the other end of the coin and something that's equally as important working out that something that you thought might have been what you wanted to do isn't as interesting as Absolutely. you actually considered and kind of reorienting your priorities, which is something that I've had happen on numerous occasions, <laughs> but I'm very I've had grateful that happen for. too while I was at university, <laughs> so it's good. Um, cool, let's keep going. But um, lots of scholarship questions. I will <laughs> advise you, if you are looking to ask about scholarships, we have our scholarships team on um, one of the other drop-in sessions. So you can just go back, scroll a bit up in the Q&A and, and select that link directly to the scholarships team. Because um, although we have Felix, who's extremely knowledgeable, and I'll try in my best to answer them, they are experts in this area and will be able to help you. Um, we will just clarify a few things if you are still um, online with us. Scholarships are open to international students as well. So um, we have a range of scholarships for domestic, international, um, it covers everyone. So it's not just exclusive to domestic students. So if you are an international student, we still encourage you to apply for scholarships. And the deadline does remain the same. That is September 30. <laughs> Um, what else do we have here? Sorry, we've got a long list generating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love this question and it's a really, really important one. So I'm happy you've asked. What happens if I'm offered an early entry offer for another university? Can I change my mind and accept another offer? Well, I'm so glad you've asked. So as we were talking about with the UAC application process, um, UNSW does participate in two rounds. One is in December and it's round two and another one is January round one. If you receive an early offer from another university aside from UNSW, well that's amazing and congratulations, but you aren't locked into that. I will stress, if, even if you've enrolled at that university, you can still participate in the UAC offer rounds and gain um, offers to say UNSW if you decide to preference us. So 
you can change your mind. I think I just want to absolutely stress that to everyone online. You can absolutely change your, your mind and there's multiple offer rounds regardless if you get an early offer or if you wait and see what your ATAR requirement I mean, your ATAR is, um, you might be so amazed by your score and you think, oh, maybe I want to change my preferences, and you can. That's the best part about it. Did you have anything else you wanted to tell them? Yeah, I'd just add to, like, reiterate, like, you really aren't lock locked into your preferences or your first offer. Like, I know I personally was changing my preferences right up until the night before the first kind of, mm -hmm. like, December 2 round offers happened. So, you know... Even if you get up to there and you're not quite sure the exact ordering or, you know, which offer you want to hang on to, don't worry. And like we said, once you get to university, there's lots of opportunities to move around, both within the university that you go to and between universities as well. Yeah, amazing. And I should say, um, just as a flag, I did talk about whether you've enrolled at another university, you can still participate um, in the offer rounds, but you just need to be aware um, that you need to notify it for tax purposes, um, just to make sure on the administrative side that it's all in order, but it's absolutely possible. Amazing, let's keep going. Um, we have a question from Jenny. Jenny is saying, hi Jenny, by the way, thank you for your question. Can having a disability learning affect your eligibility for courses? Does university have provisions in the same way as high school? So Jenny, this is a great question. And the straight answer is no. Your eligibility won't be affected by a learning disability, for example. At UNSW, we also have our equity, equitable learning services. We love a good acronym, so ELS. And this is where we can support you while you're studying and also before. We do encourage you to reach out to the team. You can chat to our future student advisors and gain more information. Or you can come and chat to the team at our open day on September 3rd. We really encourage you um, to still apply for your dream degree and have a look at that equitable access scheme, which um, I know I talked about earlier, but that's administered through UAC and it's a, an application process where you can gain up to 10 points to in addition to your ATAR for things such as a learning difficulty. I've got another student experience question. <laughs> Um, are all courses back face-to-face -face teaching? I'd love to um, hear about your experience with face-to-face -face and if you had to study online as well. <laughs> so I think let's answer this by saying that at the moment we have um, a blended option. So some courses are face-to-face -face and others are online. And for our international students, everything is available still online as we recognize some students still aren't able to get back. And we're working closely um, with, I guess, the international requirements. We have a whole dedicated international team to staying on top of where everyone is in the world and how things are traveling with, say, COVID-19. Um, the UNSW is being super flexible with what we're offering at the moment to make sure we're supporting all of our students no matter where they are. Um, for you, I suppose, what was um, what is studying like for you? Do you have a mix of online or face-to-face -face, or is it all back to face-to-face -face for you? Um, so for me, pretty much it's like you were saying, it's basically what we call blended. So it's a mix of face-to-face -face and uh, online for the most part. It's really just for most of my courses, those big lectures where it's um, being held online. Whereas things like tutorials, which are much more like kind of how you'd be learning in high school right now and laboratories, that's all back in person, actually getting to work with equipment rather than, you know, just doing the online version, which was a, a fun and unique experience in, <laughs> in its own ways. And I will just say that, you know, it's not like it's been two years of holding water and doing online and then jumping back to face to face. There's been a lot of like changes as people have like, we kind of adapted. So a lot of my classes now, where even there is an in-person component, it's quite hybridized. So if on a, any given day, you'd not necessarily want to go in or there's some reason why you need to stay home, or if you want to watch your recording back of it, there's a lot better infrastructure to support that in terms of that online learning experience as well, which is something that's great, especially when you like miss that slide change in the lecture and need to go back and fix it up. <laughs> it's always a bonus. <laughs> Um, we have another one for you. Um, this is from Brandon and he's asked, 
is STEM a course you can take? Mm -hmm. um, so STEM itself is a really broad term, so kind of to break it down, so that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, with us, that kind of sits across two faculties, our Faculty of Science, which also houses our mathematics department. Um, it's a bit of a debate among mathematicians if maths is a science or not, but it is as far as we're concerned with our offerings. Mm -hmm. And then engineering, which kind of covers the technology and engineering side of things. So you, it's not really, you wouldn't study a STEM degree, so like a bachelor's of STEM or something. You would study, say, a bachelor's of science and you'd pick one or two disciplines of science that you wanted to study or a bachelor of engineering and your specific engineering discipline that you wanted to study rather than kind of one degree that, very lightly touches on all of those areas because it's a massive set of different fields and different degrees, all of which cover a whole different set of skills and areas. And if you were trying to study them all, you'd basically do one course of each and then never see it again. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was definitely a question you needed to answer. <laughs> um, okay. So I like this one. Thank you for submitting it. How to show that you are passionate about something? specifically engineering type of area. So I believe this student might be referring to the opportunity to submit a portfolio entry um, and the way you can, I guess, showcase your passion for engineering um, is we do have that portfolio entry which is available to the Bachelor of Engineering in any specialization. Um, and what, what that requirement is, is it looks at your year 12 results but he also has a personal statement. So this can be an area where you might answer a few questions and you will be able to articulate all the things that interest you the most about engineering. Um, and I believe there is an optional um, video that you can record and submit. So that's also a very good way for you to, um, I guess, showcase and get yourself in front of, in front of the academics and the, and the committee so that you can showcase those passions. Um, and I think just with, um, in general, um, yeah, so you have to preference your degree and it is based on that ATAR requirement to receive an offer. However, again, there's the HSC Plus scheme, so that will look at some relevant subjects and reward you for doing well in those subjects. So have a little look on the website um, and you can see what subjects you might be taking that might give you some extra points. Do you have any other tips? Yeah, I'd just say, like, so, obvious, the thing to keep in mind is, if you can, really just give examples of where you've kind of done or expressed some interest in something relevant to what you're looking at. So, for example, if you're interested in art and you've done, like, visual arts, you know, you might demonstrate your representative, pick a good representative sample of your work as part of your portfolio submission. If it's engineering, for example, if you've done any of those high school programs, such as I think like the Lego robots that I know some schools have, that's a great example of something that you can put up. If you took apart toasters or something to see how they worked, it's always a good thing. Just, you know, not necessarily instances where you've been an engineer or been an artist, but some explanation and example of why you really care about that field and why you want to choose that degree. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Felix. <laughs> Got another one? Can you work while studying at UNSW? And does UNSW offer jobs? I think you can help, <laughs> help answer that one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you can. Um, so I've been working uh, while I've studied the entire time. That's been a couple of different jobs. I worked part-time, roughly 12 hours a week for the first three years of my degree. And then alongside that, I've at various points held between one and four different jobs at the U at the university working in different departments. It is worth noting that it will really depend on the person that you are, how comfortable, because of course university, especially if you're studying full time, typically each course expects about eight hours of contact hours. And then for every contact hour, it's generally said that you have another hour of self-study. So you just need to keep that in mind when you're talk planning and like working out how many hours you have in a week. But it's definitely doable and it's something you can like modulate over the years that you study based on, you know, how any certain year is going for you and if you want. But definitely something worth doing. Jobs at university that I've been involved in is stuff like doing this job here where I get to talk to all of you guys, sometimes face to face, sometimes on camera. Both are great fun. I've also had the opportunity of working as a tutor in physics. So I help demonstrate lab laboratory classes for first year. 
And there, and there are a whole range of just job opportunities that pop up around the university and the university does advertise those. And I always think they're a great thing to take advantage of if you can, because you have the advantage of working where you're studying, which really reduces commute times. And often quite a lot of those can combo nicely with what you're studying and give you, again, that kind of work integrated learning kind of, you know, not, not on that coursework style, but still that university experience and getting some practical learning on the side. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have so many questions coming in and I will flag we're coming to the close of this session. So we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. However, um, if we don't answer these questions, I encourage you to go and chat to our future student advisors team who are available um, again, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, they love to hear from you and we, you can email, live chat or um, give us a call. So let's go with one final question and then we might give some advice to our future <laughs> students who are online. Let's go with, um, there's one question here actually about overseas exchange. They've asked specifically about, can you do overseas exchange with an engineering program? But they've also asked, is there additional fees? Do you get scholarships? And when during the degree can you go? So I think overall, this does vary. Um, overseas exchange is offered to all of our UNSW students. However, you do need to work with the enrollment team to make sure it fits in with your academic schedule so that you can make sure you're not adding any extra time if for some reason it doesn't line up. I will say though that our three terms has really um, benefited from our students because our overseas exchange programs now align directly with our overseas um, university partners. So it is really easy for our students to jump um, overseas if they feel like it and go and explore a different university. Um, I think, uh, Felix, do you have any advice on when you would go during your degree? Yeah, so I think the main thing to keep in mind is you have to have completed at least your first year and generally the advice is that you want to be preparing the year in advance. So just keep that in mind in terms of when you plan to go. I always think that you probably want to be considering going in the middle of your degree rather than towards the end because like Grace was saying, you have to work with the university to make sure that it's going to fit your academic plan and when you hit the middle is when you have the most flexibility in how you're going to achieve that. And I will say the scholarships piece, we definitely have um, potential for you to gain help with your overseas exchange. For example, the Bachelor of Commerce International, I believe students who participate in that program receive a $5,000 bursary before they go overseas. So it's definitely something that the university encourages and we work with our students to make sure that it's possible. Um, okay. I think that it's almost time to wrap up. So I just wanted to ask you, Felix, what would be your advice to any future students who are online right now and looking to, I guess, study next year at university? Uh, I think my advice is to, at the moment, keep doing what you're doing, like showing up to events like this and looking at what your options are and hearing what's on offer is a really good idea. And I'd recommend, you know, not just looking at us, but looking at all the universities <laughs> around because, you know, Every university is different and they offer a different atmosphere and there was normally going to be one that fits for you. My advice, if you really have kind of been listening to us and feel that UNSW is really where you want to go, the best thing to do is come to our open day, which is on the 3rd of September. Easy to remember, it's the first Saturday of the month and it's essentially an opportunity not just for you to get through all of the questions that we may or may not have had time to answer today because we essentially lock all of our academics in a big room and force them to talk to you. But you get the advantage of we essentially put the university on display for a day. So you get to see what it's like. You can attend mock lectures, just look at what the campus is like, which I think is a really underrated and important thing to do when you're looking at universities, because it's where you spend most of your time. You really want to like where you're going to be studying. But yeah, it's just a whole great way to see everything about the university that we really can't cover in just a little sit down conversation. Absolutely. I think, and also Open Day, you almost feel like you're already part of the UNSW community. So it's something that you should definitely take advantage of. Well, I'm going to leave you with Felix's wonderful advice. I don't think I need to add anything more to that. Um, 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I've had such a pleasure being your host and having this chat with Felix and being able to really see what you're interested in and what you need help with answering. Again, please contact our future student advisors if you need more help. Send an email, um, reach out in any which way, but thank you again and good night.